All right. We are going to kick things back off here. So if you're on the other side of the room, other side of the building, come over, join us. Cool things are happening. Uh, so I'm very uh, pleased to announce our next speaker, uh, Nathaniel Cook. So Nathaniel joined us uh, in 2015, August or September. I can never quite August 31st. I was right there. It's right on the edge. Uh, so Nathaniel uh, is the is the basically the creator and primary author of Capacitor. We paired together in the very early days to create uh, the first version of TickScript, and he took it way beyond that early version. Uh, and uh, we've partnered together also to create IFQL, and Nathaniel runs the team that is producing IFQL, and he has written a bulk of that code, and he is going to be talking about uh, capacitor streaming processing. So welcome, Nathaniel. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, who's having a good time so far? Yeah? Awesome. I have as well. I've learned a ton. I've talked to a bunch of you. Um, if you have, we'll have time for questions on my talk in a minute, as well as just catch me in the halls. I'd love to talk and chat with you about how, how you're using Capacitor and the rest of the tick stack. So also, to kind of get things started, who here is already using Capacitor alongside InfluxDB? Awesome. Good fair hands to you. Awesome. So my hope today is to introduce you to Capacitor so that it becomes less scary, because that's a lot of feedback we get. Um, when I talk to people about capacitors, that it's a little bit of a steep learning curve to get on board. So my hope today is to kind of show you the breadth of what capacitor can do and, and hope that you can try it out. Get your hands dirty a little bit and take a, take a stab at, at, at using capacitor. So to get started, let me grab the clicker, that'd be helpful. Um, quick overview of what we're gonna talk about today. I'll introduce capacitor, uh, we'll talk about how to install it that's like half a slide. And then we're going to explore six different use cases for Capacitor. Kind of give us this breadth first experience of what Capacitor can do for us. And then, you know, in your own time, you can dig down deep into each of those different kind of channels for what Capacitor can do. So a quick introduction to Capacitor. Um, the purpose behind Capacitor is to enable you to take action on your data. If all you're doing is collecting data and then just leaving it in FlexDB, it's not giving you a lot of value. You need to do something with that data. So the easiest thing to do with that data is to graph it and stick it on a dashboard. And that's what I hope most of us are doing already. The next step is to actually take action on that data in some kind of automated way, either to alert or page one of your DevOps team members or to interact with third-party systems. Somehow, we need to get value out of this data and we need to take action on it. So that is Capacitor's focus. Everything around it is there so that you can take actions on your metric data. And it runs as a separate process. Um, this is kind of, uh, this is very much intentional. And it's kind of analogous to the way things are going to be working with IFQL. And that we want this decoupling between the query engine and the storage. And so Capacitor, as, as kind of move things along, will kind of become that external query engine for the data tier. And that's very much how we think about it today. And it will continue to grow and merge into that, that role as we, as we go along. So that's capacitor. So how do we install it? Like I said, it's like a half a slide. So these are the instructions if you're running uh, Ubuntu Linux. And you just simply download the Debian file, install it, and then here you can just run the daemon. Or you can use your init system, sysv, systemctl, to start it uh, if you prefer. It's similar steps for Windows, Mac, um, other distributions of Linux. Simply download it, install it, just like in FlexDB. So that's all it takes. Um, by default, it will look for an InfluxDB instance running on localhost. If not, you just change the config file, just change the one line to tell it where it can find its InfluxDB instance, and you're off to the races. Then with Capacitor, you run tasks. So this is kind of what Paul was talking about earlier today, where the, the interaction mode with Capacitor is to always run something in the background instead of it being interactive. And so the way that works is you simply grab the Capacitor CLI, and you say define my task, give it a name, and then you give it the path to your tick script. And then everything about, your tick, about what your tick script is gonna do is defined in that file. And that sets up your task to run in the background. And then if you're curious or, or you just, you know, the getting started guide's there, it's great, check it out. And it gives you a lot more detail than I've gone into today and you know, how to get, get the workflow down and you know, start using it. Um, but there's the simple steps. 
So what are the six use cases that we're going to talk about today? We're going to talk about two kinds of ETL jobs. And by ETL, I mean extract, transform, and load, your basic data prep, data cleaning steps. We're going to talk about how to alert on a relative change. Um, and this is, you know, instead of just like simple static alerts, how to kind of build up a, a really rich alert. Um, we're going to talk about how to use a hot cache, um, how to have capacitor pre-compute data for you and have it there available cache so that you can, can essentially query it on the fly. And we'll talk about how Capacitor can actually auto-scale your applications and your services. And then finally, we'll talk about how to forecast some time series data using Capacitor. So the rest of the slides are just going to be pictures and diagrams, no code. So if you are interested, then you go to this repo here at github.com, Nathaniel C, Influx Days NYC, there are six tick scripts there. They're each short, no more than about 10 lines. And you can kind of follow along if, if you kind of want to take that extra depth with you through this presentation. If you don't, that's great. We'll be talking about the concepts and, and the ideas behind each of these tasks that you can do in Capacitor. If you'd like to follow along, that's also great. Because you can see the, the concrete details of how to accomplish the things I'm talking about in TickScript itself. OK. So. Give it just a second for anybody to write down that URL that still wants it, and then, then we'll move on. And it's pretty easy to remember. Even if you just go to Nathaniel C and just look for recent repos uh, on GitHub, you'll find it there, because I created it this morning. <laughs> so there it is. OK, so our first uh, use case, pre-process ETL. So what I mean by pre-process here is that capacitor is sitting in front of the database. This is you're going to process the data before it even arrives at the database. The reason you may want to do this is to clean the data or somehow normalize the data. Maybe you're collecting data from lots of different systems, and on one system, the tag for the host name is host, and on the other one, it's host name, and on the other one, it's server. And so you've got three different names for the same thing, and you need to normalize that so that it's easy to interact with your data um, in a standardized way. So you could put capacitor in front. You could write a little task that says, rename the tag server to host, and we name tag host name to host, and now all of your tags are called host. And then you could write that data back into InfluxDB. So that's the pre-process ETL job. The example that I have online um, does a similar job where it assumes, correct or not, it's just an example, that all paths that Telegraph collects under the dev mapper path for disk usage are redundant, and that you'll also get that information out of your uh, physical disks like dev SDA or, or dev whatever else you have. And so it simply drops all the data that's has, that begins with the path dev mapper. So another simple example of how you could pre-process your data. So the idea here, though, is that it's about cleaning your data before you even get it into the database. So the next one, it's kind of the mirror, is the post-process your data in an ETL job. So in this case, capacitor sits on the back of the database but while continuing to still write the data, the data back into the database. So the use case here is, is like traditionally downsampling, where you've got a bunch of data, you collect it, you stick it in, you've got the resolution of like every 10 seconds you're collecting the data, but you can't store or you don't want to store for whatever reason all th that high resolution data. And so you, you have a capacitor query the data back out, compute the mean, the min, whatever kind of aggregates you like, and then store it back down into the database. And you can change again, the retention policy of the database, uh, however you like it. Uh, the example online simply just computes the mean over five minute intervals and um, stores it back in the database with a new name. So some advantages of using capacitor for this kind of post-processing is, again, you could do the tag rename. Um, you can do these downsample type actions. And you can leverage the full power of retention policies here, where you can for example, you could throw your data into InfluxDB, all your raw data, into a retention policy of, say, maybe 24 hours, and then have capacitor query that data back out, clean it, aggregate it, and then stick it back into the database with a retention policy of maybe infinite or, or 30 days or whatever it is that you're doing. And this way, you have a, you know, like a small cache buffer of your raw data, and then you see how it gets transformed into your later data. And this allows you to um, kind of see that whole pipeline. And Capacitor also has a nice feature where if you define a task, it, by default it runs for now, like the current time, but you can tell it to run it for historical time. So 
say you set up a task that's doing all these down samples for you, and then you realize that you missed a bunch of data at some point, some system was down, you fix it, you reload in all your data to InfluxDB, but now all of your computed aggregates are out of date. You can simply tell Capacitor, hey, go rerun this task for this window of time, and it will go and do that. And so you can, you can fix and update all your aggregates um, after the fact, which is really powerful. Okay, so that kind of covers our ETL jobs, where we prepare and clean data for the real task at hand, which is alerting. So let's talk about alerting and what I mean by on relative change. So in, when you're creating alerts, it can, it, like the easiest thing to do is just like draw a line in a graph, and then if the, the actual data crosses that line, you page someone, right? Problem is that gets really noisy um, if that graph is too noisy, and so you get these spikes and this flapping around the line, and sure you can throw in some flapping detection, capacitor supports that, and and it kind of helps to mitigate the problem, but in reality, it just becomes a really bad signal for what you're trying to alert. And so it's sometimes more helpful to define your alerts dynamically. So instead of having your thresholds be against something static, have them be against something dynamic. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So this is a visual representation of, of what the tick script would be doing. You, simultaneously, you have the capacitor task, go out to the database and select the last hours of data and yesterday's last hour of data. And you pull those in together, you compute their difference, and then you send them through something else and maybe compute like the percentage change, and then you compare that percentage change against the threshold, and then trigger an alert. And this is something that Chronograph will actually do for you automatically. So if you open up Chronograph and go to the rules section, you can in there say, I wanna create a percentage change alert or a relative change alert, and you can do it either based on the absolute change or the, or the percentage change of the values, and you can set up an alert. So the, the example tick script that is online uh, on that repo goes through, grabs the mean CPU from today, or for the last five minutes, and then the previous hour, the five minutes of that window, and takes those two five minutes, computes the mean, and then takes the difference and divides it by the, the past value so you get a percentage change, and you can then trigger an alert. So this is helpful because if you're, if you're setting static thresholds, then as your, as your data is growing, maybe you've got like a continuous growth curve, this kind of helps your thresholds kind of keep up with your data. Um, this is very specific here. Uh, there's lots of ways you can do um, alerting in Capacitor. The reality is any way that you can combine, transform, manipulate, and process your data, you can alert on that in Capacitor. And this is one example um, that is beyond just the simple static thresholds. And like I said, check out Chronograph. That's a quick and easy way to jump into this kind of alerting because it, it, it gives it to you in a point and click kind of way. So this next one is a feature that you may not know about uh, in Capacitor, and I'm, I'm calling it hot cache. But basically what it does is it allows you to set up a task and then have Capacitor compute whatever result that is and then simply cache it in Capacitor's RAM so that when you want it, you can go query it. So there's a great example of this um, in, the, in the documentation. The one I have in my repo is really trivial. Simply gets the last value, computes the mean, and then caches it um, under an endpoint. Um, in the docs themselves, there's an example about how to create a live leaderboard. So for example, say you're getting game score updates for a multiplayer game. You can pull that data in. You can compute the top 10 players by their scores, and you can cache that data. And then you can simply point your client, your, your game dashboard, at capacitor and query that, that data. And it will simply be a quick response for the client because capacitor is already pre-computed and just has it sitting there cached. And then if you, and then anytime new data arrives, capacitor will just re-update the answer and refresh the cache and off it goes. This is kind of like materialized views in SQL in that kind of world, um, uh, but slightly different. In fact, there's, a, there's an open feature request that's um, for chronograph to be able to to create dashboards out of these caches, out of these hot caches. So you can just, instead of pointing chronograph at a, at a query, you could point chronograph at the capacitor, and it would be able to render these for you. And that way, instead of paying the cost to compute the query every time the query runs, for every single browser that's out there, you pay the cost once to compute it, and then the browsers just hit the cache and return the value. So that's a, a very nice uh, use case here of capacitor. And Okay, 
So this next one kind of takes us to a very different realm um, than we have been before. Everything we've been talking about has been about communicating events and the data to other people and to humans uh, that are on call or otherwise. And this kind of takes us into the realm of integrating with other services. So Capacitor can talk to AWS auto-scaling groups, Kubernetes uh, deployment auto-scaling resources, and to Docker Swarm resources. And it can control those auto-scale points. And there's, again, the example on, the, on that little repo is the way it works is it takes data from the nodes. We have the nodes in blue, the app servers, and they simply report the number of requests as a counter that they have received. So they're reporting that to Capacitor. That's either through the database, through Telegraph, through Heapster, whatever you want to send it through. Somehow, those counts arrive in Capacitor. Then Capacitor just computes the derivative, so we get the rate of requests per node per deployment. And then we have Capacitor um, send that data into the autoscale node, and it can talk back out to, in the case of Kubernetes, then hit the Kubernetes API servers and say, hey, give me more or less servers, or I want X servers. So the simple example that I have online, um, the way it works is we simply state a target um, re uh, request per node per second. So we say like 100, 100 requests per node per second is kind of our target. It's a really low number that's easy to think about. So let's say you've got an app server and you want each app server to be able to, that you, your capacity is 100 requests per second per node or that's your target, not your capacity. You can set your capacity a little higher. And so then what it does is Capacitor takes in that, that data, computes the derivative, sums up all of the requests per second across all the nodes per deployment, and so then, so you have five nodes, they're each getting uh, 10 requests a second, then you've got you know, 50 requests a second, but your target was 100, so it goes, oh, I only need a half a node. And so then Capacitor goes, well, I've got a min set at one, that's the default, and says, okay, I'm gonna create one node. And so it would talk to Kubernetes at that point, say shut down four nodes, and keep the one alive. And then as, say, you know, a few minutes later, um, the load starts increasing again, and then this, the server maybe starts to cross the 100 requests per second threshold, it'll spin up another node, or maybe it gets a really big spike that starts to sustain, and it starts to spin up more and more nodes, keeping the target at around 100 requests per second. So this is really powerful in that we've been able to take action on our data and l send that feedback loop into other systems that aren't a human, which humans in the loop is very good and we want that for a lot of things where we need um, intelligence and critical thinking. But to just spin up and spin down servers, we don't want people in the loop. We want that to be seamless and we want that to be quick and easy. And so instead of, and this is kind of back to uh, Tom's earlier talk, instead of looking at if the computer's happy, if the resources, the CPU, the memory, or whatever are happy, we can look at the requests. We can take those red metrics, the request rate, the errors, and the duration, and we can feed that into our autoscaler and say, hey, our clients, for whatever reason, are, are getting latent requests, and it, there's the error rates increased, and we can intelligently then say, okay, spin up more servers, we need more capacity, or spin them down. Maybe you could shut down servers that have high error rates automatically, right? That'd be, that'd be pretty, pretty awesome. So that we can, you know, maybe it's just got a bad config or something and just get rid of it in the pool. So that's um, the auto scaling example where we've taken our data and we've done a full cycle feedback loop into other external systems. And like I said, that supports AWS, Docker, and Kubernetes today and um, open to contribution for any other services that you may have out there. So the forecast example. This one, um, who knows what I mean when I say forecast? Where are we at, man? Okay, just a handful of people. Okay, I'll talk a minute about that. So um, forecasting in time series is the idea of taking historical data and forecasting future data, whatever you may think it may be. And so the way this works is there's, there's lots of algorithms out there, and we'll talk about one of those today. Uh, specifically, we'll talk about an algorithm called Holt-Winters, 
which is a form of exponential smoothing. And basically, what it's capable of doing is it, it can look at basic growth trends. So it can look if you're growing, if you're declining, and it can also look at seasonality. So if you have daily, weekly, monthly patterns in your data, it can learn all those things and then predict what your future data looks like as a result of seeing all the historical data. And so it's a really, and when I say learn, I mean it's, it's like dead simple. It's an algorithm from the 60s. It's nothing like super smart. It's not machine learning or anything like that. It's just trivial, straightforward forecasting based on historical data. So that's what I mean when I say forecasting. Taking historical data, understanding something about it, the basic patterns, predicting the future. So how do we use that inside of Capacitor? So like I said, Capacitor and InfluxDB, the query language, have a function called Holt Winters built in. And it's one of these simple languages, or simple um, forecasting functions that's available to you. So the way you'd use it is you'd grab a bunch of historical data. You'd send it into the Holt Winters at forecast, and you'd tell it how far out into the future you want to forecast. So you typically need a lot of historical data to predict out a little ways. So um, in the example that I have online, we're predicting out disk usage. And we give it 90 days of history, the last 90 days of disk usage, and then we say predict out seven days. So that's not very far compared to 90 days, and so that tends to work out pretty well. And so after our little yellow box, we have data that represents seven days of data, our predicted values. Then we can do a few things. So we can wait for seven days to pass and then go look at what actually happened and compare those values, like we did on our relative alert change, and compare the predicted with the current data and then trigger an alert. Or you can simply trigger an alert based on the predicted values themselves, which is what I have online in the example. And that works really well for something like disk usage where maybe you, you want to know before it happens that your disk is going to fill up. And that's something really easy to do because dis disks tend to grow slowly, at least compared to other systems. Right? It tends to take a little while to fill up an entire disk. And that's also nice because maybe your disk is sitting at 95% utilization, but it has been for the last year. And so it's static, you don't care, it, you don't need to touch that disk, it's gonna be fine. Um, and so the, the, the prediction is gonna say, well, it's gonna stay flat, it's not gonna grow, so I don't have to alert on that one. Whereas maybe a disk that's only a few days old has been log spamming, and the prediction is that it's gonna fill up in the next three days, and you just simply send that into your alert and go, oh, in three days, the predicted value is over 100%. <laughs> That's a problem. And trigger an alert. So um, that's forecasting, is taking historical data and predicting the future and then taking action or an alert on that. So one of the nice things about Capacitor is I've mentioned that it has this whole winter's algorithm. Um, that's the one that has built in. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can forecast data, and this has been this topic of research for many, many years. And so Capacitor kind of has a bring your own algorithm or bring your own model um, uh, use uh, methodology, where Capacitor has something called a UDF, or a user-defined function, and it can be written in any language you like. Um, we support already Python and Go. Um, if you want support for another language, talk to me afterwards and we can work something out. Um, and so that allows you to use SciPy and use NumPy and all of the great uh, machine learning tooling that's already out there uh, in Python and bring it into Capacitor. So that if you, don't, if you need something more complex in your forecasting than simple whole winter's exponential smoothing, then, um, then you can. You can bring it in. And then, like I said, you can also write it in Go. And to those of you getting into Go, the Go Num, uh, project is amazing. They have lots of good algorithms and it's starting to catch up quickly with things like SciPy and, uh, and things with Python. So it's great. Okay, so Capacitor can forecast, you can bring your own model to it, and you can then take action based on predicted values. So I've talked about six use cases at this point, right? And it's kind of given us a breadth of what Capacitor do. We can clean our data, we can prepare our data, otherwise massage our data to be in the right format. We can alert on that data in interesting ways. We can cache results, and we can predict future values and interact with uh, external systems. So the fun thing is, we've talked about each one of these things in relative isolation. So what happens when we bring them all together? What happens when we look at 
the breadth of things that Classler can do, and we bring them into one piece. So pick any two of those six. So let's see, forecasting and auto scaling. Hey, many, some of you are probably thinking about my auto scaling example. It's gonna be very reactive, and you have to wait till you cross your threshold before we do anything about it. But no, you don't, right? We could easily, and, and in a lot of cases, your growth usage patterns are very, very predictable um, throughout the day. And you could simply preemptively auto scale your servers based on the past several days of usage. And that becomes very powerful because then you're not waiting on the pain of your customers to indicate that there's a problem and to therefore remedy it by spending up more capacity. You're simply ahead of the curve. And so that's something that's really exciting to me and that we kind of built these little pieces in isolation and in, in independence, and then we bring them together and we've got something really rich and powerful. So, um, so let's take another two. So we can pre-process the data and clean it before we forecast, right? So forecasting is super sensitive to outliers in many cases. So run your data through an outlier detection system first, right? That you can also bring in a capacitor. Simply use that as your pre-processing or post-processing ETL job and clean it up so that you get good, um, good results when you're forecasting, okay? So I kind of talked about this one a little bit, but you can alert on a relative change from your predicted values. So, um, like I said, kind of talked about that one already. And then you could simply alert on auto scale events. So you could set a threshold where if your auto scale event was spin up a thousand nodes, maybe you should alert someone if that's an abnormal to you, right? If you're typically running you know, anywhere from like 500 to 600 nodes for this kind of system, and then it goes up to 1,000, okay. Well, maybe our system doesn't scale that way. Let's, let's tell somebody that we just did that so that we can get eyes on that problem. That's where we probably want human in the loop on that kind of problem. Okay, pick another two, hot cache and auto scaling the metrics, right? We could hot cache all the last recent auto scale requests we've made so that as a debugging tool, it's like, what's going on? Why is it doing this? What's capacitor thinking? We can simply go query capacitor and ask it for its caching metrics about why it made its decisions. And that becomes a useful debugging tool. So, um, kind of taking us on a big walkthrough on capacitor and several different use cases that it can do. We brought them together and we've seen that, you know, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. Uh, sorry, I said that backwards. <laughs> sum of the parts is greater than the whole. That's great. Um, but anyways, the, uh, um, bring things together and we get these really powerful systems. And so where this is going is, it's like Paul talked about this morning, is we have IFQL, the new language, we've got TickScript, and we've got InfluxQL. And what we're kind of switching in paradigm is from these two products dictating the usage patterns to these two products simply being the decoupling of the read versus the write layers. And so right now in Capacitor, you can't have interactive queries, but that's kind of the direction we're headed is so that your interactive query layer is brought into Capacitor as a query system. And then we'll have a unifying language so that to those of you who TickScript feels really um, daunting, um, our hope is that IFQL is a much lower bar to entry. And if it doesn't feel that way to you, please come find me today and let's talk about it. Because that is absolutely our goal is to make IFQL easier to learn by far than TickScript and to, to be that interactive layer as well. So all of these things are coming together um, and we have this vision for the future and it involves capacitor and it's going to be this system where we have independently scaling um, capacitor nodes as the read layer and then the database are these independently scaling uh, storage nodes and the interactions between the two will become richer and, and more flexible. So thank you today for listening to me, and uh, that's my talk. Do we have questions? We've got a bit of time for questions here, so let's go for it. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. When you talk about um, downsampling, is there a way to, without you know, having a lot of foreknowledge of, of measurements or metrics in a measurement and downsample everything? Capacitor does not allow that any easier than the database does right now. 
So you're probably talking about in continuous queries, similar systems, it's hard if you have lots of fields and you want to aggregate each of the fields and then it becomes, so unfortunately capacitor kind of inherits that same problem from, uh, from the database. But uh, with IFQL, because the field is now a tag, the field name is a tag, sorry, I kind of said that weird, um, it allows you to group by the field so that you can then apply the mean operation to all of your fields in a single step. And so describing those kinds of transformations on your data is, is absolutely doable in IFQL. And so that's, that's one of the things that we're directly addressing with that. Thank you. I have a question at the end too. It's coming. When you described hot cache, could I think of that as a possible replacement for Redis or some high velocity key value store that that could expose through an API to other dashboards or like I, I think I think of capacitor being an alert engine and what it's mm -hmm. designed for. The, the use case I was thinking of, I was thinking it had to coexist with something like a Redis. And is that? Yeah, so it's a not quite like Redis in that you can't just directly write data to it. You, you indirectly write data to it, right? You, you write data to capacitor to the normal way you normally would. And then the way it works is in your tick script, there's a node called HTTP out. And it's kind of a weird name, but it works. So it allows you to get at your data via the HTTP request. And the data format that is returned is identical as if you had queried that data. And so it's the same data structure in FluxDB. So it's not quite like you can set key values um, and then have capacitor cache them for you, but it is a cache of the result of a tick script or a query. Thank you. Mm, uh, is it possible to alert based on the uh, relative changes, but in real time, not querying from the database and the batches. Okay. Um, so, to rephrase the question. Like, I, <coughs> I, yeah. I may query in the batch historical data, but I want to alert at the real time when the point comes in, uh, when, which data is batch. Right. So, so in the example I gave, we're querying the data every, every five minutes, but you want to query the data for historical data query the database for historical data, and then compare that to exist to current data being streamed in. So um, are you familiar with Passer? Have you used the tick scripts at all? A little bit, okay. So there's like the stream versus batch concept. Um, you cannot mix them right now. And that's not something that you can easily do, but one thing you can do is you can reduce the every interval or how frequently your query runs. So you could run your query every 10 seconds and then, and then, but still extend its history so that it gets the last five minutes, but every 10 seconds you get these kind of sliding windows. And that will reduce the latency down to 10 seconds for your, for your alert as opposed to five minutes. Um, but it does mean you're doing more work. Mm. Is it possible to run continuous queries and loop the data back in as real time and then join the, with the real time stream to compare? Hmm. So let me rephrase the question, make sure I understood it. So you want to run a continuous query and have the result of the continuous query being piped back into capacitor right. so that you can um, then compare it against the other stream of data. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head if continuous query writes get piped back out to capacitor. Mm. Um, that is a good question. Um, okay, I have a separate question about the availability of capacitor and when it runs, what happens with it cache? where it's stored or when it's called run, it doesn't have any cache. Okay, so like if you restart capacitor, what happens? So capacitor only stores state about alerts. That's the only thing it stores. So um, meaning that if it knows that something was down, when it comes back up, it'll remember it's down and, and vice versa. So that means any data that's in your windowing um, is just lost. And that's just part, of, just part of the design decision early on with capacitor is it's monitoring data for the most part Things are, you know, we don't we care about the data now, not necessarily data from a little while ago. Um, that kind of semantics will change with IFQL. Other questions? Great. Well, like I said, oh, we do have questions. Uh, yeah. One more question. Um, so, is the thought that the IFQL will? replace the text, uh, I mean, text script entirely, or it's going to kind of coexist and be like a, a second language for querying purposes 
primarily. So ISQL, the intent is to unify the languages so that this, the system has one language. But that said, because we're decoupling the language from the actual query engine, the, the, the plan is to be able to actually execute TickScript on the new query engine. And so all existing TickScripts will continue to work, we'll be able to continue to invest in those, and maybe years down the road, we deprecate TickScript once ISQL has completely um, sunsetted it. But that's, that's way far in the future, um, you know, backwards compatibility for now. That's definitely the plan. Thank you for the question. One more over here, great. It's really hard to see with these lights. <laughs> you have no idea until you get up here and you're like, can Capacitor ingest data from um, other data sources other than Telegraph? Yes and no. So Capacitor accepts data writes just the same ways InfluxDB does. So if you can get your data into InfluxDB, you can get it into Capacitor. Um, and, and conversely, if you got it into InfluxDB, Capacitor can get at it as well. Um, so that means the Graphite endpoint, the UDP endpoint, the TCP and the HTTP, and all of those various inputs that InfluxDB supports directly, um, so does Capacitor. Um, but as far as reaching out to other systems and pulling data, uh, only InfluxDB at the moment. Thank you. Oh, yes, you, I it's great. Yes, so you write a service in front of it to translate it into line output, mm -hmm. line protocol. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you could write a service. And then, thank you, Paul. I have uh, forgotten my about Capacitor has full Prometheus scraping support. So it can reach out to all your Prometheus targets, just like Prometheus, in fact, works with the Prometheus guys, and we have their code as a library in Capacitor. And um, so, yeah, Capacitor can reach out to your metrics endpoints and scrape all that data and consume it directly. Right here, my friend. Yeah, right here, my friend. <coughs> Thank you for these questions, by the way, they're great. How do you handle high availability of capacitor? Like, what if one goes down? Do how do you like connect to another one? Or like, like rerun queries we're supposed to write because it was down. Like, is there any wall or like something write a headlock? Some 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 stuff like that. Yeah. So capacitor. Um, there's kind of two answers to that question. The first answer is if you're running just the open source version of capacitor, and there is an enterprise version of capacitor. Just the open source version. Just the high availability store is you have to replay the data. Right, either go re-query it as InfluxDB, or otherwise rewrite it to Capacitor. Um, in the story of Enterprise Capacitor, we have clustered Capacitor. So you can spin up Capacitor nodes, so you can point them at each other, and it creates a, a cluster. And the features that you get with that are alert deduplication. So you can run your tasks and send the data to both Capacitor nodes, and then it, they will both do the work, compute it, and you get this kind of active-active workload. And then when they go to generate alert, they'll communicate with each other really quickly and decide who should actually send the alert. And, um, and then, then it fires the alert and the other one just sits silent. And so the, the high availability story for capacitor um, enterprises is pretty tight. And then setting up capacitor enterprise is just the same as the installation that I talked about. The only other step is you just have to say capacitor member add and then the URL um, of the other capacitor server and then they start talking. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and yeah. thank you. Thanks, Nathaniel.